and a very warm welcome to the Bitcoin Briefing. Today is Friday, January the 14th, and we're going to start off with some price action. So, you know, this year, or at least the start of this year, has, has, has not been too kind to, to Bitcoin. We've basically been on a, a consistent downward downward uh, step since since November, really, in the height of uh, 69,000. But we do need to put this into you know, something of a perspective because currently we're at 42,500 and that was a pretty good price for most of last year. Um, however, you know, relatively speaking, when you're down from 69 to 42, you do feel like you've taken a bit of a hit. But I think we, you know, really, you know, you need to zoom out on the graph a little bit. Um, now, for me, I'm definitely still buying at these levels, but then again, I was buying at 69. I'm, um, you know, certainly not the best trader and um, basically a perma bull. So, I mean, I was buying at 3,000, I was buying at 65,000, and uh, I'm buying today at these prices too. I, I do expect us to go on a bit more of a pump. Um, the fundamentals right now in the, you know, the wider economy, as we're going to talk about later, the, the new inflation figures in the United States is, is 7%. Um, money has been printed basically into a, oblivion. The asset market is, is, is booming. Really, I think for Bitcoin, we only have upside from here. We might go down to 35, but I think while my prediction of 100,000 in 2021, you know, obviously fell short by 31,000, I, uh, I, I do think that this is the year that we're gonna hit six, six figures. Okay, so I don't wanna focus on price too much because largely, and I think it's probably the same for a lot of people who watch my channel, we're you know, holders for the long term. And you know, the price in any given month is really irrelevant. Um, you know, quite often when I'm explaining to people that maybe Bitcoin is a, a better store of value than keeping it in cash, the, the first thing they'll say is, you know, it's, it's crazy, crazy volatile. And that's true, it, it is volatile. I mean, it, we, we were looking at, you know, swings of 80%, sometimes 50%, or well, what are we now, like 40% from the top. It's, uh, it is crazy volatile, but my reply usually is that, well, you know, you, you have to buy it, and then you have to kind of like wait or hold it for three, four years, a halving cycle, until you've got the, the 5X on your investment, and then the volatility is, is irrelevant. You know, if you're buying it at 3,000, and then suddenly, four years later, it's chopping between 60 and 40K, you know, that is a good problem for you to have. And for the people that are buying it now, okay, at 40, well, you know, you just might have to wait two or three years until, until the prices are, you know, bouncing around 250 and 140, and, and you, you know, you're kind of sitting pretty at that point. Um, but I don't want to focus on price too much because this isn't a Bitcoin trading show. It's not a Bitcoin price show. This is a, a Bitcoin fundamental show. We talk about technology and news and the cultural and the cultural implications of of what the future Bitcoin economy, the Bitcoin standard, would look like and what the implications are for us as humans um, and, uh, and and you know wider society. Okay, so let's start off with the first news this week. We have legendary investor Bill Miller, uh, who is a famous value investor, but was also joked about, and you might recognize him, he was the man in the big short that at the end Steve Carell is debating with, and uh, Bill Miller, I think he was called Bruce Miller in the film, was the man who, who uh, was saying the, the fundamentals of Bear, Bear Stearns is, is strong, as the price was, was crashing mid-debate. Now, I mean, that caveat would suggest that he was wrong about the, the housing crisis, and perhaps he's wrong about Bitcoin. But I think on this, he's, he's right. And it looks like he's gone 50% uh, Bitcoin and 50% Amazon, which is a, a concentrated portfolio, certainly. Um, but it just goes to show that, you know, Bitcoin has moved on so much over the last couple of years. It is, you know, it's no longer the preserve of the more rebellious or libertarian or, uh, well, let's just call them contrarian people. And it really has entered into the mainstream with being probably one of the best returning assets on, 
on many billionaires and Wall Street balance sheets. Next up, we have Jack Dorsey, the ex-CEO of Twitter, who has launched a legal defense fund for uh, Bitcoin developers to protect them against litigious uh, malevolent actors. I am, of course, speaking of people like Craig S. Wright, the, uh, the vindictive billionaire who claims that he is Satoshi Nakamoto and yet is using his considerable fortune um, and energy to, to well, basically destroy and undermine and hinder the project as best he can. Um, so Craig S. Wright, trading under a Tulip Trading Company, I think it's called, um, is currently suing 16 Bitcoin developers, which has prompted Jack Dorsey to, well, I guess, come to the rescue in a way. Um, and, you know, it, it's certainly needed because, as we saw with Gorka and Peter Thiel, uh, you know, an organization, when it has been targeted by a uh, angry and motivated billionaire, you know, it, it really doesn't stand a chance. Gorka didn't stand a chance against Peter Thiel. And that's not to say Peter Thiel and uh, Craig S. Wright are anything like each other. I mean, what? Peter Thiel did to Gorka, I think was totally justified. But what uh, Craig S. Wright is doing to Bitcoin is just, well, um, it, you know, it's, it, it's terrible. And um, he's going to lose. But in many ways, you know, the, the process is the, is the punishment for, for, um, for these people. And these kind of attacks on the Bitcoin developers, which is probably one of Bitcoin's softest underbellies, is... Um, is an attack on the network because it hinders uh, the work of, of the developers. It hinders the the, uh, the progression of the project. It also creates it, kind of turns Bitcoin and certainly the development side into this kind of hot legal potato that no one really wants to to be holding or to be exposed to. Um, you know, you go near the project and you become radioactive, and your life is tied up in in very expensive law suits for the next two, three, four, five, ten years, who knows. Um, I mean, he's got almost unlimited resources and uh, yeah, he seems to want to just use them to, as best he can, destroy Bitcoin. So yeah, Jack Dorsey to the rescue. He's been a bit of a busy boy since he's left Twitter. Um, and you know, for this, I, I, I certainly commend him. So let's see what, what he's said. Two Bitcoin developers. The Bitcoin community is currently the subject of multi-front litigation. Litigation and continued threats are having their intended effect. Individual defendants have chosen to capitulate in the absence of legal support. Open source developers, who are often independent, are especially susceptible to legal pressures. In response, we propose a coordinated and formalized response to help defend developers. The Bitcoin Legal Defense Fund is a non-profit entity that aims to minimize legal headaches that discourage software developers from actively developing Bitcoin and related projects such as the Lightning Network, Bitcoin privacy protocols, and the like. The main purpose of this fund is to defend developers from lawsuits regarding their activities in the Bitcoin ecosystem, including finding and retaining defense counsel, developing litigation strategy, and paying legal bills. This is a free and voluntary option for developers to take advantage of if they so wish. The fund will start with a core of volunteer and part-time lawyers. The board of the fund will be responsible for determining which lawsuits and defendants it will defend. And it's going to start off with the, the, six current, the 16 current pending um, lawsuits that have been filed by Tulip Trading Company. So, I mean, th this is great. Um, well done, Jack. Uh, and, and I guess somebody had to do it because he, you know, he's right that, you know, that most Bitcoin core developers, they're, they're just independent people. They're just ordinary people, you know, and they have no chance of, of standing up to um, a billionaire who's going to use the courts as, as, as their weapon. They're especially susceptible to, to that kind of pressure. Um, so yeah, this is good. All right, next up we have another Jack, Jack Mallers of Strike. He was the man who was basically behind the the um, El Salvador turning Bitcoin into their into their national currency, and he's 
company Strike provided the technology behind the, the Shivo uh, app, which is basically just the El Salvador's digital currency wallet, the, the state digital currency wallet. Um, and yeah, now after a huge success in El Salvador and what the president is doing at the moment, which I'll cover in, in, in another show, Jack has planted his flag in Argentina in a post he made yesterday. Today, we launch a superior financial experience to a country that faces hyperinflation, predatory payment networks, and unusable cross-border transfers. Today, we use the world's open monetary network, Bitcoin, to give hope to the people of Argentina. And I would say not just Argentina, but you know, all citizens of, of these upper second tier, I mean, is it unfair to say second tier? I mean, I think Argentina is obviously a much larger economy than El Salvador, but I mean, these, these are, uh, okay, rapidly developing nations, uh, I suppose we should say. These nations that have everything, they have smart people, they have resources, they have uh, um, relatively stable governments, but, but uh, the one thing they don't have is, you know, a good, strong, sound money. They're constantly at the mercy of the US dollar and inflation. Uh, El Salvador especially because, you know, the dollar was a, was a, was a currency there and they had all of the uh, negative aspects of using another country's sovereign currency as your own currency and none of the benefits of, of you know, the dollar being the, um, the world reserve currency. Now, this news pairs very nicely with a report that was released earlier this week, which states, we also think there is a very high stakes game theory at play here, whereby if Bitcoin adoption increases, the countries that secure some Bitcoin today will be better off competitively than their peers. Therefore, even if other countries do not believe in the investment thesis or adoption of Bitcoin, they will be forced to acquire some as a form of insurance. In other words, a small cost can be paid today as a hedge compared to a potentially much larger cost years in the future. We therefore wouldn't be surprised to see other sovereign nation states acquire Bitcoin in 2022. Now this is an interesting thought experiment. What happens when everybody buys Bitcoin as a hedge against Bitcoin becoming the future world currency? Does that mean the Bitcoin becomes the currency because everyone is just buying it because otherwise to not would be dumb. It's an interesting thought experiment and yeah, and every way I look at it, I just can't see how Bitcoin eventually at some point in the future, unless it's killed, it ascends. To me, it's Bitcoin's either killed or it ascends eventually because we have this game theory, we have the hard money fighting against soft money. At no point in history has a, a soft money ever been able to compete long term with a hard money. People will spend the bad money and save the good money. And we have all of these forces that are kind of necessitating Bitcoin's success. That's not to say it'll be easy or soon. But honestly, what's there to stop it? Thank you.